The monkeys are in the most dangerous areas where the most dangerous people are. In the past, I knew that if I was going to the FARC area, that was FARC area. If I was going to the paramilitary area, I knew who I have to talk to. The problem now in the three border area is that you have fractions, several different groups. You have Brazilian narco groups that they are fighting for controlling the territory in the, in the border. And of course that, that hinders my, my work, the politics, the business, the corruption, the monkey business. There are like the same group of people. So yeah, I have the threats. In a couple of occasions, I thought, yeah, I could be killed. No one is going to find my body because I'm in the middle of the nowhere. But I also think that you have to be very positive, like here and here, because every single human has a good side. How would you describe your, your work, your conservation work in the Amazon? My main work right now is to study the night monkeys that were used for malaria research for many years. And so we do research on that species, but we also do uh, education. And I do uh, a lot of low cases against wildlife traders. What are the biggest threats facing the primates and other animals that, that you see in these jungles? Deforestation. Deforestation is the main one and wildlife trade. No wildlife trade for consumption, for pets, for biomedical research, for tourism. But I will say the biggest threat is deforestation because once the habitats are gone, everything is gone with them. No, so it's very important to have, especially for big species like woolly monkeys, that they need primary forest. Small species can survive in fragments, so fortunately for them, but the largest species, they need primary forest. So that's the main problem right now, hunting and deforestation. And, and deforestation for what? For commercial crops, for illegal production? What, what are the drivers? Depends the, the area. For example, in the center of the Amazon right now is for cattle ranching and for palm oil and for, for crops. Uh, in the Amazon, down where I am, fortunately, deforestation is not that big, but it's for timber and for coca plantations. That even in very remote areas, you cannot detect them with satellital pictures because they are small. And that's the idea, not to have small ones, different small patches of coca around places so that people cannot see. But yeah, you have to deal with these people working in the area and, and that's part of doing field work, no? You need, sometimes you have to ask for permission to be able to work in those areas. That, that brings with it its own risks, its own risks to you and scientific study. What are some of the risks you face when you're dealing with people who are involved in illicit trade, in this, in this instance, in a drugs trade? For example, about the coca crops and that, that is not our duty to do anything about that because that's the authorities who have to deal with that. So I'm always very clear that what we are going there is to try to start a conservation project and study the monkeys, but we have nothing to do with the, with the coca business is not our issue and the authorities have to deal with that. So sometimes I have to talk to them and ask for permission because we have to go to the forest to capture monkeys. For example, we did a study where we took blood samples from the monkeys to find, uh, to do a genetic study, but also to find parasites in, in blood. And then I have to explain all this to them. In most of the cases, they are illiterate people. So you have to put everything in very simple words and ask them for permission to go and do this work. And I always said, this is not what you are doing here is not my business because it's, it's a fact. No, it's not what we are looking for. About the people doing the trade of wildlife, that's different, no? Because that's the issue that I need to tackle. So when I file a uh, complaints with the authorities, the corruption is so high in that area that they inform the people doing this. So I don't do that anymore. I did that for many years. So what I do now is I inform the authorities at the central level. And now I have good connections with the prosecutors, with the police, so I can give the information directly to them and I don't have to get involved with the local or regional authorities. What, what personal risk to you did, did that level of corruption and having to navigate and negotiate with people who, whose trade you are trying to stop? It's all 
all the same thing, no? Like the politics, the business, the corruption, the monkey business, there are like the same group of people. So yeah, I have the threats. Many years ago, that was like in the year 2000, I was in the FARC area. And to go to the next uh, town, I needed to ask for permission to, to the commandant here. And then they have to communicate. And yeah, sometimes they thought that I was a spy, no? And I remember those areas are remote and they, the people have a lot of money, but they cannot spend it. But then everything is super expensive because it's very difficult for them to get food and all this. So I went there having a budget, no, living in Bogota and everything was four times more expensive. And, but that time you don't find a cash point, you, what you have in your pocket is all. And then I realized I'm not going to survive. And people didn't want to talk to me in that town because they thought that I was a spy. No one told to me. And I thought like, this is very strange, but I have a similar situation in another part of Colombia. So I understood that and it takes days to break the ice and that they finally realize that you are no a spy and that, no. But that time at the end, no, after four days, people start talking to me. And then because of that, I, because I receive a lot of intimidation, like persecution, the threats, then you get used to that, no? But the last time that was 2019, I was working with people from the, from the Congress in like the lawyers from someone that is supporting our work in terms of law enforcement. And I just say, ha, huh, look the email that I received. You, you think that that's normal, no? At this point. But they were like, oh my God, this is terrible. This is, this is a big risk. They, you need to get out. So what they did is they asked the government to give me a protection scheme, a security scheme. So I have a bodyguard, um, uh, anti-bullet jacket, and I have like a mobile as part of this scheme provided for the government, like for one year and a half, no? So, yeah, there are risks. And anyway, we know that these kind of schemes are not going to save my life, no? So what we need to do sometimes is get out of the area or try not to be predictable when we are doing our work. You talk about the civil war and you, you, you negotiate and you work with FARC or in areas that FARC were operating in that, in that period. Did that add challenges to your work? Or was that just past the nature? It depends. Like in the past, when I had to deal with permission from different groups, I knew that if I was going to the FARC area, that was FARC area. If I was going to the paramilitary area, I knew who I have to talk to. The problem now in the three border area is that you have fractions, several different groups. You have Brazilian narco groups that they are fighting for controlling the territory in the, in the border. There are two big groups and they are fighting between each other and against other groups. So when you are in the field, sometimes you don't know who is in there, no? So you have to be very careful with, with what you say, no, what you ask. And sometimes it's better to say, okay, we, we can go to another side, no? So, and of course that, that hinders my, my work because if I don't have those issues, I won't waste all this time, no? And, thinking all the time you need to do a risk assessment no how much risks or how no how bad could be the situation is it worth it or better not to go to that area so all the time you have to assess if you have to go or not and sometimes you have areas with a lot of wildlife that you really want to go there but then you have to wait no the the threats in the area. So it's, it's very difficult. Some of your work relatively recently has been on the, uh, on, on specifically on trafficking of primates. And you've had some big wins and you recently got a, uh, an animal testing lab closed down or you're involved in that. Could you just talk a little bit about that work that you did and what the outcome was and why it was such a big win for, for the animal trade? Okay, first we wanted to find the conservation status of the night monkeys in the areas where they were trading them. So we did census field work, you know, that was just to find how many individuals per square kilometer were in our study sites and then compare areas where they were hunted and hunting the monkeys and 
areas where they were not or where hunting was was less of a threat. So we compared the populations. Also, we did um, socioeconomic analysis of the trade dynamics, like why selling these monkeys it, why it was important for local people, no? So for us, it was very important to understand that the lack of legal uh, opportunities is one of the main drivers. Legal job Exactly, to, yeah, to find a job that will pay you and that is a legal activity. So you need to show evidence. So because corruption is very high and this lab had a lot of resources, they were bribing everyone. So for me, it was like, going against the current all the time, no? I have all the system against me. So I, then I ended filing a law case and I sued the regional environmental authority that they were the ones in charge of giving the, the trapping permits for biomedical research. I sued the lab and I sued the Ministry of Environment for not doing their job properly. I won that case. And the persecution I received from every single way was very hard. And then we keep doing a follow up. And then in 2021, the pressure to the authority was so strong that they don't issue any more permits and we think it's not going to happen. And at the same time, with all this scientific evidence, I was making my case to say how endangered these animals are in Colombia, because that's where I am. So uh, thanks to all these studies and this evidence, we could show that it's important to classify Aotus Nansimae as endangered for Colombia. So after I managed to do that, it was fantastic. You know? People working in conservation know how important it is to have the right assessment. And then this species entered in the list of threatened species for Colombia. So the species is, is protected. That was this year. So it took me 12 years to get to this point. No, So it was a long path, but we have all the evidence and we managed to do what we wanted to do. That was just to protect the species from biomedical research. Is there optimism for biodiversity and big agreements, big global agreements, um, tied in with the corruption that you're talking about. Is there optimism for a better future where we work together on biodiversity? We have to be optimistic. We need to have hope, otherwise, what's the point? No, We know that corruption is, is high and many countries, they just know that if they sign environmental agreements, they will have to lower their income. So that's the big problem. And what I think that we need to think as civil society is push the governments no, to do what they have to do. We have legal tools to do that. If my government is uh, others to uh, no, the CITES or any other conservation biology, whatever, any, any agreement, then if they are not doing that with legal cases, you can push them to do that. But as civil society, I think that we have to focus in children and teenagers because they are the ones that are going to face everything in the future and we have to empower them and also give them tools, make them understand that they have to defend their fundamental rights because environment is a, for, for in Colombia is now um, a right, no? So if you tell them how to defend their rights and how to defend the environment, there is hope, no? We said, oh my God, everything is destructive is, is in destruction and we are losing biodiversity. Yes, but we still have a lot. Let's protect what we have. And we have to do it now. Angelo Adnare, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.